Hi folks, uh, my name is Jim Foster. I am the chair of the AT Hall of Fame committee and uh, this session is supposed to be meet the uh, 2022 class, but due to a, a variety of circumstances, it is an interview with only one member of the, of the class, but, but a very important person, uh, Lori Pottinger. And I'm proud to say that Lori's also a personal friend of mine. I hope, hope she would agree with that assessment. Uh, when uh, I'll tell you, uh, I want to tell you first about this room, and then I'll tell you some story, uh, a story that I have about Lori, and then I'm going to talk to her a little bit. Uh, we are here in the Iron Masters Hostel, uh, and it is a very old building. It was built in approximately <coughs> 1830. I don't have the exact date in my head. And uh, it's long, for a long, long time been a hiker hostel uh, and has had several folks who've, uh, who, who've run it, several organizations who have run it. Beginning in 2020, the Appalachian Trail Museum uh, began to operate the hostel. That was great in one sense, but not so good in another sense in that it was the beginning of the pandemic. And so we had a lot of grand plans for what we were gonna do with the Iron Masters and those have yet to come about. Uh, but, you know, and, and the uh, AT Museum only has two full-time employees and the rest of us are all volunteers. So it's a process and, and we'll get there. One of the first things we've done is to uh, transform this room into what we're calling the AT Hall of Fame room. And uh, we've made some significant progress in the, in the last uh, few months and we're, we're gonna make some more. Uh, over here are the uh, plaques from the first four Hall of Fame classes. And over here are the, uh, the, the Hall of Fame sticks. Uh, there is one stick, which is the class stick, that is made by our, our Hall of Fame stick uh, carver, uh, Bodacious, John Baudet, every year. Uh, each member of the class gets a stick, and then there's a class stick, which stays here. And we finally had a place to keep each stick, and, and this is that place. We also have a stick that's here, um, but secured so that it won't walk away so that you can take pictures of yourself with a stick and, and that sort of thing. Um, so, I, welcome. This is our second program at the AT Hall of Fame room. The first one was Warren Doyle's presentation an hour earlier. So, uh, I, I'm going to read just a little bit about Lori from our uh, press release. Lori Pottinger through hiked the AT in 1987 using the trail name Mountain Laurel. After that, she began volunteering with ATC in Harper's Ferry and soon was hired there. Following in the footsteps of her mentor, Jean Cashin, she became the ambassador of ATC to thousands of visitors, including countless through hikers at ATC headquarters as information services manager. She helped to found the Flip Flop Festival designed to encourage long distance hikers to begin their hikes at various places along the trail rather than adding to the annual crush in Georgia. Beyond her role in Harper's Ferry, Lori has been a supporter of the Appalachian Long Distance Hikers Association, also known as ALDA, was an early supporter of Larry Luxemburg's dream to found an Appalachian Trail Museum, and is a relentless advocate for Leave No Trace principles. Uh, when we introduce uh, Lori this afternoon, uh, when she's formally in inducted, we'll have a story or two about that, but uh, we'll leave that uh, for later. I'm, I'm pleased to say that, uh, that Lori is a friend of mine. Uh, I threw hike the AT in 2007, and when I came to Trail Days in Damascus in 2006, I met Lori, probably pestered her unmercifully about, with questions about the AT, <laughs> And after going to trail days and, and talking to Lori and some other people, I made the decision to, to take the plunge and through hike the AT. So, uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm uh, proud, as I said, I'm proud to say that Lori's a friend of mine and, and I've known her for about 15 years. And I, I just want to say that I, I remember meeting you um, first um, as early bird at 
ATC headquarters when you came through, but then, mm -hmm. then learning about your background and just seeing all your, um, your skills and talents and organization skills, and I was just like, we gotta reel this guy in. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems like they succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> and here he is. Um, we got the hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lori was uh, involved with the AT Museum movement uh, long before me. How, how early was it that, that uh, you and Larry Luxemburg were involved in, uh, in the, the idea of an AT Hall of Fame, or the AT Museum? Um, I couldn't give you the year, but I do remember that first conversation. It was, um, he just kind of, I think he said, you know, can, can, can we go outside and can I ask you a question, something like that. And we went into what's now the ATC Tribute Garden outside. And I just remember he posed the question, you know, do you, do you think the Appalachian Trail Museum, do you think that's a good idea? And I was like, that's a no-brainer. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> uh, that would have been, you know, maybe a year or two before formal meetings got started. But somebody mm -hmm. else probably knows those dates better than I do. Well, 98 was the uh, year Larry first uh, really put it out there. It was yeah. the 50th anniversary of Earl's Hike. Yeah. And then 98 gathering, we had, you know, Lucy Seeds and uh, Gene SB and had this as one of the launching points for that. And you, I believe, were one of the original members of the board as the ATC representative. So it was probably 96 or 97. And um, I do remember, in the, you know, when he first talked about it, um, Larry was like, well, maybe we can have like a few like um, cases at Bear's Den. And I, the, the one advice I feel like I gave Larry that was unequivocally uh, good uh, was, yeah, go bigger. <laughs> go beyond that. Think, you know, think, think big, dream big for the AD. Good, good. Um, I'll start with kind of an obvious question. How did you first learn about the Appalachian Trail? Well, my father was a, a trail maintainer with the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club, would lead hikes. And, uh, but actually, we didn't go on the AT all that much because we always did day hikes. We had our family vacations at the cabins, but we'd stay in the cabins overnight. And so the problem with the AT is you can't do a loop on the AT itself. So we often did our hikes other, other trails. So even uh, I remember uh, being at Shenandoah at a wayside and seeing some through hikers uh, when we were kids. Um, but my dad was an early influence and then um, um, I sort of forgot about it um, until I attended a nature camp near the trail in Vesuvius where a three hunter in 1973 gave um, a slideshow about his talk and that planted the seed and then I forgot about it again until I was taking Russian, my last course in Russian in master, uh, getting my master's degree and there's a symbol on the in the Russian language that looks just like an A over a T. It's like a sign. It's, it's, okay, so it's your time to do the AT. I forgot all about Russian. Russian was no longer in my history. The rest of my life became the AT. So this just popped into my head, but have you ever had occasion to use Russian on the AT or in the, in the course of your uh, uh, AT work? Actually, not on the AT itself, come to think of it. Except um, on my Georgia to Maine hike, I, I did write <laughs> Russian poetry. <in> the <laughs> yeah. But um, increasingly, at the AT Visitor Center in Harpers Ferry, um, our visitors um, you know, became more diverse and more international. And mm -hmm. occasionally, I get to speak a few words with a visitor. But I remembered less and less. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite section of the AT? OK. Oh. You know, when I, when I did my Georgia to Maine hike, there were definitely favorites. Um, probably Max Patch. But then when I did my section hike and when I could choose where and when to go, I fell in love with every piece because I got to see it in the spring or the fall or the summer or whatever that ideal glory is, you know, with the autumn leaves or, you know, I go gaga over wildflowers. So um, section hiking, totally different experience in the AT, which had big ups and downs, I mean, in terms of how I felt about sections. Mm -hmm. Um, is, is there a, a, a person involved with 
the AT movement that you most look up to? Oh, I, I, I could never put one person. It would be like a, a list of 100. I mean, I'm looking at one of them right there. And, and who's that? Um, Ron Tipton. Um, you, Bill, my husband. Okay. And as I was telling Warren, even though um, you know we disagree on a lot of things, especially you know in my role at ATC, and even personally, um, I I think there is a role for the person that challenges and questions hmm. the powers that be, and because somebody should be asking those questions, and the organizations should, to their th their own satisfaction, be able to be comfortable with answering them. Um, Everyone in this room. <laughs> Let me ask you about Gene Cashin in particular. Can you can you <coughs> tell me? Uh, uh, Gene Cashin, by the way, was inducted into the AT Hall of Fame, I think, in 2019, and she had your position before you. Is that right? She was the Information mm -hmm. Services Manager. 24 years. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, tell me about your relationship with Gene Cashin, please. Well. Um, when I first came to ATC in 1988, um, you know, she was downstairs. The um, information, uh, her title is information <coughs> service specialist, 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 information okay. specialist. And so, um, I mean, she was the kind of person, I mean, she was this trail mom. Everybody loved her. It was just um, kind of magic to just watch her interact with people and just uh, the grace and the genuine love that she had for people, the warmth. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was just, it was great fun working mm -hmm. with her, you know, when we got to do um, trail information stuff or, you know, share information about what was happening along the trail. I'd be taking orders and um, somehow there, our worlds would, would intersect and it was mm -hmm. awesome. How did it come about that you became uh, Jean's successor? Well, she announced that she was going to retire, and then they uh, posted the position. You know, so uh, they took outside applicants, and so I applied just like everyone else. It was a very nerve-wracking <laughs> experience because I, you know, um, I knew that eventually that would, role would come open, and uh, so I applied and I did get the job. But you know, I was scared to <laughs> death. <laughs> scared to death. Uh, yeah, and then Bill Bryson comes along, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like two weeks on the job, and then you know what happened. With the, with the tell, tell us, tell us a little more about the Bill Bryson experience. Um, well, Bill Bryson, um, I guess is everyone familiar with the book, the author. Um, Most of America for, is. for those who might be viewing this, Bill Bryson is the author. He's authored many books, but he's. He's authored probably the most famous book on the Appalachian Trail called A Walk in the Woods. But go ahead, please. So I remember um, when he came in, it was, it was actually kind of quiet, and I think he was over, sort of just uh, hovering over to the side, and I think he waited till everyone left. I remember it was like just dead quiet. And as, as funny as, as uh, he is you know, in his talks and his writing, when we talked, it was, it was just deadly serious. And it was just like you hear a pin drop. And, um, I feel like uh, I was talking to a fly on the wall. It was, it was still, to this day, I've never had a visitor that questioned me in that same way, just so serious. Of course, something serious would really, hap really happen, but yeah, I just remember it was, uh, it was kind of freaky experience. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love him as a writer. I just think he's brilliant with the way he puts words together. You may not agree with you know, how you feel about the book, and some of the things he says, but I think he's, he's one of my favorite authors. Oh, yeah, I, I would agree with that, too. Honestly, A Walk in the Woods is not my favorite Bill Bryson book, but, but it's a good book. Uh, so uh, when I tell people that I've through-hiked the Appalachian Trail, almost always the second question that I get asked is, have you read A Walk in the Woods? How many times have you been asked that question? Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> A lot. A lot. Yeah. Um, you have, you and your husband uh, are involved in maintaining the trail. How long have you been involved with, with maintaining the trail? Since uh, 1995. Okay. I remember the exact time. It was um, 
uh, at the biennial conference in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And Chris Brunton, who, who we already knew, because um, you know, we're in the same neck of the woods. Remember, he came up to Dick and me and said, oh, Dick and Lori, I can't do his accent. Um, <laughs> Dick and Lori, have I got a section of trail for you. <laughs> it's so beautiful. You're just going to love it. You've you got to take it. Um, somebody that had been maintaining like three miles of trail but just said he's got to split it because he had a family. And uh, so, you know, easy access at Blackburn. Please take it. You'll, you, you just you got to do it. So, you know, we did. First time we went up there, the trail was overgrown with raspberries. It was like, uh, you know, I remember Dick got stung by yellow jackets and poison <laughs> ivy. It was like, like, this is not a nice section of trail. <laughs> uh, but we worked on it and changed it, and, you know, now it's like a second home to us. Oh. I, I have a few more questions, but I'm wondering, uh, does anybody uh, in the audience have any questions for Lori? Yes, sir. Sure. And th uh, this is Dick Pottinger, by the way, so I'm, who knows what's going to happen here. <laughs> that isn't the first time she maintained trail. I guess you guys know Ed Garvey? Yeah. Ed Garvey said the first time he met Lori was on a PATC work trip, and she was in a stroll. <laughs> <laughs> her dad brought her to the oh, work trip. Well, that is similar to the to the Dentons. Uh, we're hoping that the Denton children are going to be here this afternoon. We have some some uh, pictures of the of the Denton children as as babes in arms on the train. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, other questions for Lori? Yeah, Lori, I want to ask a version of the question that I asked Warren because you you have a un you've had a unique opportunity to. Um, just over 25 years or so to interact with through hikers, long distance hikers. What would you say, how would you compare the hikers of 20 or 25 years ago to today? I mean, there's a variety of ways you could compare them. Obviously, as Warren mentioned, technology makes things different, but I'm thinking more about what motivates them, what are they getting out of the experience? What, how did you, and you, of course you met most of them, or a good percentage of them. What's your perspective on that? Well, yeah, you know, certainly I've thought about that and certainly wanted to analyze and dissect and try to have answers for that. But, you know, honestly, um, I feel like, you know, human nature has not really changed. And, yeah, um, hikers are definitely more wrapped up in their technology. Um, but I feel like hikers have not really changed. It's just they come from different backgrounds. More of them are urban. Fewer of them have grown up in the outdoors. I think the one thing that you could quantify um, is, and, and you didn't ask this question, but the things that I've seen change is uh, the weight of hikers, especially northbounders, <laughs> coming into ATC headquarters. They, on average, I think, especially the, the thou at the thousand mile mark, they are a lot heavier because I think Americans' average weight has grown up. And then there, there's, uh, you've got lighter packs, and you've got more frequently resupply, and trail magic, and all kinds of things that, um, so for what it's worth, that's probably the one thing I can say that you could um, quantify. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, I remember um, in 87 feeling like there, there weren't many, there, was all, there were very few people out there for like the nature experience. Um, there was a guy that hiked uh, half the trail my year next and wrote a book about how disappointed he was in all the Appalachian Trail hikers. Uh, so, you know, I don't really see that huge a difference in, in hikers. But I'm not out there as, I mean, I'm not out there hardly, you know, at all compared to someone like Warren. So I'm not in the trenches to know just what I, you know, observed at headquarters and here and there. I've I will have, uh, I will give you the opportunity to ask more questions, so please uh, be thinking about that. But uh, uh, I think that one of many great things that you've done is the flip-flop festival, because when I through hiked in 2007, uh, I started right in the, in the middle of the, uh, of the crush. I started on March 25th, and it's, I, I, I wouldn't consider myself an antisocial person, but just the, the hordes of people just was, 
was pretty disconcerting. It didn't seem like much of a wilderness experience. And what I did is I worked like heck to, to get above the bubble, to get, to get in front of the bubble. And after about 100 miles, I, I succeeded in doing that. And I think the idea of, of encouraging people to start the AT at different places uh, and, and, and then to finish up uh, and, and still do a through hike, but just not necessarily starting from Springer Mountain is a great idea. And, and it's, uh, it seems to me that it's been pretty successful. I, I, I've, I've noticed uh, just anecdotally a, a, a significant increase in the number of people who are doing flip-flops. So my question for you is, uh, did the idea of the flip-flop festival, was that your idea or was that somebody else's idea? And, and tell, tell us a little more about how that came about. Well, um, ATC, we've been sort of quietly, slowly promoting um, flip-flop through hikes, but it was part of, I think, Ron's strategic plan. And uh, now um, I'm, I, I, had, I, had it, I was so proud I had all the five points memorized <laughs> at the time, but it was something about conserving the trail. And it, we had, so there were multiple strategies on how to deal with overuse and still keep the AT experience. And so this is just like one of the strategies along with like AT camp and, um, you know, I think sustainable use, something along those lines. So that, was, that just became one of the things that was part of the strategic plan, one way to achieve the goal of accommodating increased use. And uh, then the festival itself, um, I think I just threw out the idea, well, why don't we have a flip-flop kickoff? That was, you know, <laughs> play on words. Um, and just invite flip-floppers to start it at uh, Harper's Ferry. And then it just sort of took off and got renamed the flip-flop festival. But the town kind of liked the idea. And um, in the shoulder seasons, Harper's Ferry back then didn't get as many visitors. And it's like, well, then it's good time for hikers to start, good way to promote it and bring more business into town when, you know, things are kind of slow. And, and from your point of view, has it been successful? It, I think it has. Um, you know, I don't see the numbers anymore, but um, in the years that I was there, I saw the numbers increase um, from, actually it used to be flip-floppers that started intentionally in the middle of the trail was like less than 1%. And when you saw numbers mm -hmm. of flip-floppers, it was the sort of the accidental flip-flopper. Mm -hmm. When they started in Georgia, something happened and they realized they wouldn't have enough time and then they'd flip up to Springer. So the, the actual numbers don't really capture how much it's grown. Those kind of flip-floppers, there's fewer of those. More and more people plant, do the, and, and those hikers are still starting, the ones that's, that flip later are still starting in Georgia are part of that crush, as you call it. When people intentionally start, those numbers have really grown from like 0% or 1% to, to more than the number of southbounders. Hmm. So it's yeah. still a small number, relatively speaking. I wish it, was, wish it were bigger, but it's not for everybody. And we try to make it clear, you know, that it, it's, it's not for everybody. You know, you do not have the grand um, finish on Katahdin. And you're giving up some of the social experience and the whole linear. It's, so it's not for everybody. But I just want people to be aware this yes. is an option. Because people are aware, because, uh, you know, 33 years during the Appalachian Trail Institute, I asked people what their plans are. And it used to be, you know, through high northbound, southbound. But increasingly over the years, people put flip-flop. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it has gotten out there. And, you know, you've given people a very viable choice of seeing that trail in a different way. Or doing Thank it you. Differently. Yeah, we don't have data here at the Iron Masters, but we, we see an awful lot of of uh, hikers here, and I think anecdotally uh, we're seeing a, a, a significant increase in uh, in flip floppers, which mm -hmm. which from my standpoint is uh, is a great thing. Uh, other questions for Lori? Larry, I. Are you sure you don't have a question for Lori? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what is kind of some of your most rewarding experiences from, from your time at ATC? Well, um, 
getting to meet um, all the hikers. Um, um, I never, well, I don't know that there's anything I got tired of, but um, I don't know, just making those connections. I loved um, to take pictures of hikers, and normally volunteers would be the ones that was their job, but uh, you know, we get busy or someone was out sick, I got to take pictures. I mean, those are small things. I think, um, and I'm also thinking about what I'm gonna say in my little three minute speech, but um, uh, you know, seeing Leave No Trace take off, um, so that, you know, empowering people to do things themselves, to pr each individual hiker can do things to help protect the AT, and just seeing how the culture has changed um, around that. And you know, of course I get such a thrill out of um, flip floppers. And one question I have for you all is, um, do you see flip floppers starting at the museum? Do you, and have you ever thought about doing um, anything here? It's uh, the answer to your first question is yes. I, I think there are a decent number of people who uh, start the trail here at Pine Grove Furnace. I think, uh, I, again, this is just anecdotal, uh, but uh, I think a lot of people who live in Pennsylvania tend to, if they're doing a flip flop, they tend to start in Pennsylvania, either here or there's a couple other logical places like Delaware Water Gap where you might where you yeah. might start the trail. There, so, there is one now that I'm. Um, thinking about it, there's one drawback of starting here is that you only have um, basically the Cumberland Valley to get ready for the Pennsylvania rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> that's, that's so, so one of the most significant who started here was uh, Nan Reisinger, mm -hmm. who at the yeah. time was the oldest woman to have completed the trail. Mm -hmm. And she started and yeah. ended at the museum. Yeah, Nan lives in Camp Hill. Uh, so yeah, she, she's, a, she's local. This um, location might actually be a better place for people to start a, um, a Sobo wraparound yeah. flip-flop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's a, I, it's a good idea. Uh, and maybe it's something that, uh, that the museum ought to think about is having some kind of uh, our own version of the flip-flop festival. Uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's a good idea. Another Other questions for Lori? I have another question, just sort of off the top of my head suggestion. Um, we have the Flip Flop Festival in Harper's Ferry, and we have this great team of people that do pack shakedowns, um, mm -hmm. led by Jim Fettig, and he brings the five PATC Ridge Runners. But you know, when people are getting ready to launch on their hike, that's not the time that they're usually ready to part with their gear. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for Northbound mm -hmm. Hikers, Neil's Gap is yes. so well situated. You know, five days of for most people that haven't attended Warren's class, they're suffering and have blisters and they, they're dying to get rid of their weight. And there's the outfitter to you know, help them with that. Um, but I'm thinking you know, maybe the museum, if there could be something here to, to help hikers um, shake down their packs. Mm -hmm. that's, that's another good Especially for the, you know, those flip -flop, in the flip-flopper season, northbounders don't need any help by the time they get here. Yeah. Um, well, in addition to your work at ATC, uh, uh, you're also known for being an advocate for uh, Leave No Trace. I believe you're a, uh, a Leave No Trace master educator. Um, can you talk a little bit about the principles of Leave No Trace uh, and why you think they're important? Well, um, you know, essentially Leave No Trace is, is about um, sustainable use and what the individual hiker can do to participate in preserving <coughs> the AT. And it's, all voluntary, and some it's it's principles because the specific actions may vary depending on what kind of terrain you're in. The desert, you do different things than you do um, on the AT. But it's um, some of it's common sense, like plan ahead and prepare. Um, some of it has to be taught, like how to dig a proper cat hole. And uh, so there there's a, a need for education for parts of it, and uh, you know it it can become um, just uh, part of the I mean, I think actually the best way to teach Leave No Trace is to incorporate it into teaching people how to backpack and just assume that this is part of how you learn instead of, oh, here's an intro to backpacking course, here's a Leave No Trace course. How many people are gonna take the Leave No Trace? They wanna be successful. Mm -hmm. So it should all be you know, integrated. Yeah. And then you know, what you do with your food, um, that's an evolving thing. So specific practices do vary. But um, I'm a big fan. Uh, my favorite piece of equipment is um, 
a trowel. <laughs> <laughs> we may talk a little bit about that during the induction. Oh. You and Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions for Lori? Actually, I just, I would just make an observation and ask you a question. What I've noticed and when I was the head of ATC, what I really loved to do was to sign all the certificates, mm -hmm. every one of them. You know, just to see the composition of people that are hiking from where and so on. And two things that I observed, first of all, and I've seen this since I retired, more women hiking the trail. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've got to be now, it was 30% when I left. I imagine it's getting 35 to 40% now. And you see that all over the place now when you hike. The other thing, and I'd ask you this, Lori, what about, what about um, people from other countries? What, what kinds of trends have you seen there? Oh, it's, it's, it's definitely increasing um, from very few to, uh, you know, there were 40-some countries that last, um, uh, you know, last that I remember. The interesting thing is um, there are more international hikers, and now, you know, um, it's getting fuzzy for me, the percentages, but there are more international hikers than there are people of color. In this from this country, so there's uh, you know a diversity in many respects, um, but not not others. So Norman, it's way more this year than normal because for the first time in three years they've been able to get a green card. Uh, right. So you've got a lot of international hikers on the trail this year. That's nice to hear. <coughs> But yeah. I think I think there is there is a bit more diversity now than there was. Yeah, definitely on the on the increase. Yeah. Sure, and I know um, you know ATC has many programs yeah. to try to address that, and it's something that takes time and you know continual um, assessment and introspection about what you know what's really um, working and what's um, the best way to go. Mm. Other questions for Lori. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, for, for uh, in, indulging us, uh, and uh, it's, we've we've learned a lot about you and and about your uh, your career with ATC and about your your relationship with the AT. And so, thank you very much. That's a real honor.